Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to our NPF Town Hall for a COVID-19 update. Uh, thank you all for joining us and taking the time today. We've got two wonderful speakers, but before we get to that, I just wanted to go over a few small housekeeping slides here. Actually, just one slide. So uh, there is a toolbar up at the top uh, where you, or at the bottom of your screen where you can pull down participants. And we would like you to keep your mic muted during this presentation. And uh, hopefully at the end, we'll have time for a few more questions if they're not answered during the presentation. And if so, then you can uh, do a raise hand and, and we'll be able to call on you. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, Bev, I'm going to pass it over to you for just a few minutes so you can introduce our speakers. Great, thank you, Jane. Uh, certainly on behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you again for attending. I'd like to introduce our speakers, dermatologist Dr. Joel Gelfand, who's a professor of dermatology and of epidemiology and vice chair of dermatology, as well as director of the Psoriasis and Phototherapy Treatment Center at University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine in Philadelphia. Dr. Gelfand is also the Vice Chair of Clinical Research and Medical Director of the Dermatology Clinical Studies Unit and Senior Scholar at the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at University of Pennsylvania. Additionally, Dr. Gelfand serves as the NPF COVID-19 Task Force Co-Chair, leading the development of the COVID-19 guidance statements for people with living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Joining Dr. Gelfand is Dr. Stacy Bell, Chief Scientific and Medical Officer at the National Psoriasis Foundation, who has worked closely with Dr. Gelfand and other members of the NPF COVID-19 Task Force to address questions about the coronavirus. The task force has been monitoring the evolving nature of the pandemic and assessing data as it becomes available for our community, making changes as needed to the guidance statements and developing resources such as today's town hall for the well-being of everyone who lives with psoriatic disease. So together, Dr. Gelfand and Stacy will answer key questions we received for today's town hall. But first, Dr. Gelfand has a quick COVID-19 update he'd like to provide. Okay, thank you so much, Bev, uh, for those uh, nice introductions. And uh, it's, it's great to be with you all tonight. I'm really happy to see so many people uh, joining us and also so many more who are registered who will probably be listening to this uh, when uh, their schedule allows. Um, so uh, as Bev mentioned, I'm Dr. Joel Gelfand. Uh, I have a large research program uh, and clinical practice dedicated to the management of patients with psoriatic disease. Uh, and I invite you to follow me on Twitter where I regularly post about the latest research findings uh, in psoriasis, either from my program or other programs uh, worldwide. Uh, can I have the next uh, slide? All right, so, you know, really the reason why we're here tonight uh, is because of, uh, of the uh, shifting in the pandemic uh, to a new variant of the virus called the Delta virus. And, you know, we were doing so well in the US uh, in, say, May, uh, of this year, uh, case counts were down dramatically, deaths were down dramatically, uh, and with the advent of the Delta variant, which is much more contagious, and the fact that we still have tens of millions of people uh, not vaccinated uh, against COVID, we just have a very large reservoir of people in the U.S. Uh, who uh, can easily get infected with this virus and easily transmit it. Uh, and unfortunately, now we're back to about 150,000 cases a day in the U.S., uh, over 1,000 deaths uh, per day in the U.S. You know, as many I'm sure you've heard in the news, uh, many health systems in the South where they're having a, a real peak in the, in the epidemic right now uh, are, um, you know, are overwhelmed uh, with COVID cases and COVID patients. And, and what we've learned from this is that virtually all deaths occurring now and virtually all hospitalizations are occurring in unvaccinated people. So, so that's what's really driving the current situation that we're in. Uh, can I have the next bullet? And as I alluded to earlier, what this is about is really the, the Delta variant, which is much more contagious. It has what's called an R naught of 8.5. And what, what that means is that the average person who is infected with this variant of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, 
that they infect an average uh, about eight or nine people. And this is a, 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 um, a schema that I, sh I pulled from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, which really shows uh, what this means, right? So, you know, the initial version of the um, of SARS-CoV-2 that we had in this country um, infected on average about two to three patients uh, from one person. And you can see as you go from generations to generations, you know, one person infects two, those two infect about, you know, four or five, and it goes on. So you can see on the right side in yellow, how when your R0 goes from two to three to eight and a half, you get this explosive exponential growth uh, of the transmission of this virus uh, throughout our communities. And cut the next bullet. And the next, you know, critical thing that we've learned is that with the first variant, it really looked like that when people uh, got infected with the with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, earlier variants of the, of the virus, and they were vaccinated, it really looked like they wouldn't transmit the disease. Um, the vaccines were 95% protective against any symptomatic infection. It seemed like they were virtually 100% protective against hospitalization uh, and mortality. Um, and when they did get infected, they, would, they did some studies where they would swab people's noses and see that they had such low levels of virus in their, in their upper respiratory tract that it seemed like they probably wouldn't pass the virus on. And that's why the CDC said, you know what, if you're vaccinated, you take off your mask because you know uh, obviously you're protected, you're not gonna get very ill if you get infected, but most importantly, you're not gonna pass the virus to other people who may be vulnerable. And so that's really the key thing that's changed is that we have a virus that's much more transmissible. And then also amongst vaccinated people, vaccinated people it's now felt probably can transmit the Delta variant because the, bi this, the biology of that, uh, that new variant we're dealing with. And Delta now makes up almost all um, infections in the US at this point in time. The other thing that's come up is that uh, we've learned from data from uh, around the world, particularly Israel and more recently in the US, that certain people may be more susceptible to, to what we call vaccine failure, or what you may have heard as breakthrough infections, if you will. And this seems to be mainly people who are, um, uh, who are elderly, usually 75 or older, uh, those who have potentially waning um, uh, immunity from the vaccine. There's some data suggest that you know, after six or seven months or so that the protection of the vaccine may be declining a little bit. Um, and, and mainly seen in people who have severe underlying health problems, you know, active cancers, severe underlying lung disease, things of that nature, or who are receiving immunosuppression for a transplanted organ. So, you know, really significant immunosuppression. And so that's what's, that's what's driving some sort of recent thinking by uh, the CDC. And we'll get into that in a minute. Cut the next slide. All right, so uh, over a year ago, we established a COVID-19 task force with, Nat with National Psoriasis Foundation. The members are pictured here. Uh, we have 18 voting members. Uh, these are folks who are uh, experts in dermatology, rheumatology, pediatrics, uh, infectious disease, critical care, uh, the epidemiology and immunology. Uh, as well as we have some uh, you know, up and coming stars in our fields, uh, junior faculty and fellows and senior staff in the National Psoriasis Foundation. And, and so working with the foundation, uh, we review all the data every single week that comes out with COVID, from COVID uh, that's relevant for people with psoriatic disease. Uh, and in real time, we put out guidance to the population uh, based on a voting process that helps us make sure in a transparent way that we all uh, agree uh, with whatever recommendations we're putting out uh, to the population. Come the next slide. And to date, we've published two papers in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology uh, and put out 33 recommendations. And, and I really want to encourage people to regularly visit the MPF website. Uh, they have an excellent COVID-19 resource center and our updates for our statements put up uh, there regularly. So, you know, it takes us a good two to three months to put a manuscript together, get it reviewed, get it published um, in the JAD. So, so we recognize we have to be giving out information in real time here. And so everyone gets our recommendations well beyond, before uh, they, they hit uh, the printing presses. Next slide. All right, so it's basically three types of uh, approaches to making vaccines against COVID, uh, two of which are currently available in the United States. The mRNA vaccines, those are made by Pfizer 
and Moderna. The Pfizer one is now fully FDA approved for people uh, 16 and older uh, and is under EUA for people 12 or older. And then uh, there's Moderna, uh, which is under EUA for people 18 or older. And we'll be going with full approval pretty soon is my guess. Uh, and then there's uh, the vector-based vaccines. Uh, and in the US, we have uh, the one dose vaccine approved uh, to be used this is by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, next slide. Now, most of what I'm going to talk to you, to, to you tonight is going to be about the mRNA vaccines, the two-dose vaccines. And that's because by far, that's the overwhelming majority of vaccines that have been used in the U.S. population. And it's also where we have the most data. Uh, but certainly the J&J vaccine is a reasonable vaccine, and I'm happy to take questions on it later. I'm just not going to talk about much in this presentation. So, you know, there's been, obviously, there's always concerns about, uh, about safety of, of any medical product that we have. And what I'd like to say is that these vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, some of the most, some of the best studied products uh, in the history of medical science. Okay, the, the clinical trials involve tens of thousands of patients. I'm putting this perspective, uh, when we get a new drug approved for psoriasis, that's usually approved in about two to 3,000 patients. All right, so we have you know, tens of thousands of people experience here. And now I'm showing you this data from Israel where they've looked at about 1.8 million vaccinated unvaccinated patients who receive, you know, in their population. Uh, so uh, nearly uh, 900,000 people who've experienced the vaccine and they're quantifying in their system the, um, the potential side effects that they may see uh, from the vaccine relative to what you see if you have a natural infection with SARS-CoV-2, if you develop COVID-19, okay? And so the, horizontal, the, the vertical lines in orange uh, are the risk that you see these outcomes if you get infected with the virus, uh, the risks in blue are what's been seen with the vaccine. And you can see that for all of these outcomes, especially the serious ones like kidney problems, arrhythmias, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, uh, heart attacks, things of that nature. Uh, all of them, uh, the risk is far outweighed by natural infection compared to the vaccine. Uh, the only thing where you see higher rates of events with the vaccine compared to natural infection uh, is uh, lymph node swelling, which is uh, a, a minor side effect and resolves. So it's not really medically worrisome. Um, and then possibly uh, herpes zoster or shingles, which can uh, seem to occur more commonly in vaccinated people uh, than in those who are acutely infected with the virus. That's still a very rare thing to occur, um, occurring about two people for every um, uh, 10,000 vaccinated. Okay, so the overwhelming likelihood people get vaccinated is that they're not gonna experience any significant side effect beyond what we normally expect, which is people may feel a little febrile for a day or two, they may feel a little crummy for a day or two, uh, but those symptoms resolve. Uh, so, so clearly the vaccine uh, is much safer than getting infected uh, with uh, the virus and the absolute risk of these unusual side effects is very, very low and unlikely to affect any of us uh, who get the vaccine, statistically speaking. Um, Cut the next slide. All right, so the other thing we've done is, of course, those of us who take care of people with psoriasis or who are living with psoriatic disease, uh, it's reasonable to be worried about, you know, if I have an immunologic disease, what happens if I get vaccinated with one of the mRNA vaccines? Um, you know, is it going to make my joint disease flare? Will it make my skin disease flare? Um, and, you know, this is a little bit of a challenging thing uh, to study uh, in detail. Um, because the reality is that it seems like if vaccines uh, trigger or flare psoriasis, it must be a pretty uncommon or rare phenomenon because we don't really see it very often uh, in our clinical practices. So we reached out to the CDC and they, they did a study for us and they communicated to us in, in August. And basically what they did is they looked through all their adverse event reports uh, in what's called the VAR system. And what they basically told us is that uh, there's been, at the time they did their the study, there was 190 million people in the US who had received at least one COVID-19 vaccine, okay? Uh, they only had 60 reports of psoriasis being aggravated, aggravated okay? And, and anyone can report it. If you're a patient who's experienced 
um, exacerbation of psoriasis, you, you should report it. Go to the CDC. I always encourage people when they contact me on social media, say report it to the CDC so we can find out. Um, so only 60 reports have 190 million, 190 million people um, uh, vaccinated. And then when they study this thing using what is called a disproportionality approach, they basically have found that there doesn't seem to be any higher rating, any higher reporting of psoriasis flaring from this vaccine compared to any other vaccine they've ever studied. You know, flu shots annually, pneumonia vaccines, zoster vaccines, et cetera. So the CDC's perspective and response was that they don't currently see a signal that the vaccine somehow trigger uh, psoriasis. Um, and then, you know, what I'm showing in the side here, this picture, this is a, a case report in the literature uh, of a person who got vaccinated and, and, and seemed to have a, a temporarily associated uh, flare in their psoriatic disease. So, so there are certainly some case reports out there of, of people who get uh, the COVID vaccine and then, uh, then will experience a flare in their skin disease. And, you know, based on the analysis of the CDC, in uh, over 190 million people vaccinated and the reports they get, uh, it, it doesn't seem like there's a causal relationship. These are likely coincidental events because when you have this many people getting vaccinated, and if, if for those of us who live with psoriasis, we know that flares occur for all sorts, all variety of reasons, that some of these may be just be pure coincidence. Uh, kind of next slide. And in contrast to this is really uh, is a number of reports in the literature where people get naturally infected the virus and have severe flares of their, of their psoriasis uh, disease. And this is, a, a, this is just a, a sampling of some of the case reports out in the literature of patients, many of whom had this mild COVID uh, and, and then had severe flares of their psoriasis. And this is, has been my clinical experience during the pandemic is that I've yet to have a patient, and I take her you know, many, many, many patients with psoriasis, probably over, uh, probably close to a thousand at this point. And I've yet to get a patient call in saying, oh, my psoriasis is flaring after I got my vaccine. And yeah, I've had many of my patients who've gotten infected, uh, you know, have issues with their psoriasis flaring or losing response to their biologic treatment, things of that nature. So, so I think this is kind of a similar story that I was just showing you with the slide from the one drill on medicine, where, where you know, my, my sense is, uh, is that if in fact the vaccine can trigger psoriasis or flare psoriasis in some uh, unique subset of people, that it's likely very uncommon and likely much more likely to occur from natural infection with the virus than it is to occur uh, in the setting of, um, uh, of getting vaccinated. Let me have the next slide, please. All right, so the rest of the slides are gonna be talking about uh, effectiveness of the, of the COVID-19 vaccines, the mRNA-based vaccines. And these are studies that just came out from the uh, CDC uh, about two weeks ago or so. And, and this is what drove um, the FDA and the CDC to come out with guidance about giving um, uh, boosters or extra doses of mRNA vaccines to people who they uh, define as having um, immunosuppression. Okay, so um, this is one study that, they, that the CDC has done, and what they found was that um, the vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization uh, is at about 85%, meaning an 85% reduction in the risk of getting hospitalized if you get COVID-19 and you're vaccinated. And it seems to stay consistent, um, you know, up to 24 weeks. So this is pretty good news, and you can see uh, the vaccine effectiveness uh, holds up. Um, in all patients and people who are older than 65. Um, in, and it's a little reduced in people who are immunocompromised. And they define immunocompromised in this case as people uh, typically who have had an organ transplant. So these are people on major immune suppressing medications. Seems to hold up a little bit in people with uh, multiple comorbidities as well, the ones we worry about the most. So you get a sense here that this is sort of a good news slide, but those who, who are immunocompromised probably have a slight reduction uh, in the vaccine affecting this particularly uh, as they get further away from the vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and then they had two other reports that came out. This is a study had New York State, uh, period of uh, from May to July. And they found that the effectiveness against hospitalization was uh, stable, uh, a reduction in hospitalization by between 92 to 95%, which is really remarkable. If you think about that, that means you're 20 times more likely 
to get hospitalized uh, if you are um, if you're unvaccinated compared to vaccinated. Um, and then uh, and then they did see so some of uh, drop in effectiveness uh, effectiveness against infection itself. I mean, people having symptom, symptoms of COVID uh, from about 91% to about 80%. Uh, that's still pretty good protection when it comes down to it. Uh, and most vaccines uh, against viral disease don't prevent infection completely. They're, they're really designed to prevent serious illness from infection. Uh, the second thing they found was for nursing home residents. So these are um, you know, elderly folks uh, often who have uh, significant underlying health issues. And they found that, uh, that the initial vaccine effectiveness in that population was about 75% protecting from just infection, okay? So, and then it declined about 53% um, in a period of, of June to July when the Delta variant was the predominant strain affecting these patients. Now here, they, they didn't have enough cases to look at hospitalization or mortality. So the vaccine still seems to be holding up pretty well against things we worry about the most uh, in terms of severe illness from COVID. But you can see there's some signals here that in certain populations over time, uh, how well the vaccine works seems to, seems to wane a little bit. Uh, next slide. All right, and then finally, there's been a number of papers published in the literature looking at how uh, therapies we use for psoriatic disease uh, impact how well the vaccines work based on blood testing. Uh, these, aren't, these aren't clinical studies, so we, we don't really know how this relates to whether or not the patient would get infected with the virus uh, or have a serious outcome from the virus. They're really just looking at biomarkers in the blood. And most of these studies have been shown in people with rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. This is one of the few that was done in people with psoriatic disease, so I'm showing that here tonight. And this was just looking at the first dose of, of an mRNA vaccine, in this case, the Pfizer vaccine. And then what they show is that the one dose of the vaccine, uh, that there were people on methotrexate, they had a slight reduction in their antibody response, uh, but their T cell response seemed to be preserved. Um, and then they saw no uh, change in the um, antibody response of people on TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors or IL-23 inhibitors. So in other words, all the classes of biologics we use for psoriatic disease didn't seem to affect uh, the, the, um, the antibody response in the blood uh, or the um, cellular response. So this is a pretty good news slide for people with psoriatic disease. And, and my sense is, is that um, it, when they do this work uh, and follow up or do get their second dose of the vaccine, it's highly likely that the patients on methotrexate uh, will have had an adequate uh, immune response, but we have to await uh, those data. Certainly we know they seem to have a good response in their T cells and that, that's reassuring. Uh, next slide. All right. So, so then task force has put out this recommendation for, for uh, our community based on the data that I presented to you uh, thus far, which is the first thing is that we, you know, the, the FDA essentially approved these boosters uh, based on data in patients who had um, uh, transplantation, you know, uh, kidney transplant, heart transplant, uh, liver transplant. Okay, these are people who are on uh, very substantial immune suppression, uh, not people who are on targeted therapies or low dose methotrexate, or type of therapies we use for psoriatic disease. And, and so the CDC sort of generalized these data from people who have had an organ transplant to the broader population of people who may have some degree of immune suppression or, or immune modulation um, in a theoretical concern, okay? So, so there's no data that the CDC had or the FDA has to suggest that the therapies we use for people with psoriatic disease or people with psoriatic disease are gonna somehow be um, inadequately protected by the existing COVID vaccines we have available. So this is sort of, uh, was generalized this patient population to have an abundance of, ca of caution, in, in my opinion. Um, per the CDC and FDA, this, this third dose uh, or booster vaccine that some call it, should be given at least 28 days following uh, the two dose regimen of the same vaccine. Meaning that if a person got the Pfizer vaccine, they should get their booster with Pfizer. If they got the Moderna vaccine, they should get uh, their booster with Moderna vaccine. Uh, although the CDC does say that, you know, for some reason, uh, one vaccine is not available, you can get the other one. 
Okay. Um, now, you know, the task force basically said, all right, so if you're on any therapy for psoriatic disease that somehow targets the immune system, whether it be methotrexate or premolast or, uh, or biologics, that then gives you the choice uh, as a patient that you are now eligible to get a booster vaccine if you want it, okay? So by being on these medications, that makes you eligible for getting a booster of the mRNA-based vaccines. And we recommend shared decision-making with your healthcare team to decide whether or not a booster is likely to benefit you. Because based on the current data, we don't really know if a third booster is absolutely necessary uh, for patients with psoriatic disease taking the therapies we use for psoriatic, for, for management of, of psoriasis. Um, and that's because it's likely that the first two doses that the person has received are likely working quite well against severe disease. And the incremental benefit of an extra dose is just unclear at this point in time. So these are the people we think should probably consider getting a booster vaccine. Uh, those who are 50 year and older, uh, and that's based largely from data from Israel. Um, as I showed you earlier, it seems like uh, people um, 65 or older still seem to be doing pretty well uh, with their uh, vaccine responsiveness. Uh, some newer data the CDC has not released yet seems to suggest people 75 or older are the ones who are having issues with vaccine failure. So uh, the older a person is, those are the individuals that we think should probably take advantage of being eligible for a booster. Uh, those on medications that either based on um, how, they, how they work mechanistically uh, or based on some data available where we think they may impair how well the, the vaccines work, these are medications like a beta cep, the cyclosporin, or lofunamide, or steroids, or methotrexate, or tofacitinib. Uh, these individuals may want to consider getting a booster as well. Uh, those who have had their second mRNA vaccine uh, six months ago, this, that seems to be the time period when um, there seems to be some waning of the benefits of the vaccine against uh, infection, not necessarily severe disease, but infection. And then those with underlying comorbidities known to increase their risk of severe COVID-19. Um, and so what I do in my, in my practice when I talk to my patients about it, usually if there's you know, at least two of these factors at play, uh, then we usually decide, okay, we probably should go ahead and get the vaccine, get the booster. You know? So someone's 60 years old and uh, they have health issues and their, their, their last vaccine for, was over six months ago, that's a person who, who may want to choose to, to be on the safe side and, and get a booster. Um, someone who's otherwise healthy, who's relatively young, had their vaccine four months ago, you know, they probably don't need a booster right now, uh, and, and they may want to hold off until we have more data. All right. Uh, and then finally, um, out of an abundance of caution, uh, because there's some data for flu vaccines that, uh, that if you're taking methotrexate at the time of that vaccine, that it may slightly reduce the antibody response to the, to the immunization. Uh, and that holding it for two weeks after immunization seems to improve that in people getting a flu shot, uh, that maybe if someone's disease is very well controlled in consultation with their prescriber, they may want to consider holding their methotrexate for two weeks when they get their third dose of an mRNA vaccine. Uh, let me have the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to be turning it over to Stacy now. Outstanding, Joel, as always. Thank you so much for the information. Um, and I hope that you are ready for tour de force of questions because we have um, received several. Um, I'll do my very best to address the questions topically, I'm really kind of lumping some common themes together. I think many of these questions you've already answered. And, you know, I'd like to reiterate too that many of the questions that we received are, you know, that are specific to a specific uh, health history and individual. Uh, many of those we will refer back to their physician to have a conversation with them uh, because we have a number of, of specific details for individuals, and I think that'd be better addressed in that, that patient-provider uh, partnership, as you mentioned. I think that, you know, and I'll speak to the questions we're getting through the National Psoriasis Foundation, too, whether the questions are coming directly to the research and medical team or whether they're coming through the patient navigation center. I, I think there's been a lot of confusion as far as you know, do I need to get a booster? Um, and if I do need to get a booster, when? And so you'll hear a lot of the questions, you know, really relating to that. So the first thing, and you've addressed this question generally, but could you comment on what the benefits would be 
to getting a booster, and what would happen if individuals decided to not receive the third shot? Right. Yeah. So, so this is something that's still a little unclear because we don't have uh, enough data yet to prove that the booster is um, is necessary in everyone. Uh, to prove that's necessary in people with psoriatic disease who are on immune modulating therapy, there's a little bit of data emerging from Israel, uh, observational data suggesting that um, that a couple of weeks after getting a booster vaccine, that the rate of infection from COVID declines. Um, now, that's not severe disease, again, which is what we're most worried about. That's any type of symptomatic infection with COVID. So, so there's a little bit of data that that third booster is providing some benefit against symptomatic infection and in people who are getting it. But that's all we have right now. Okay. And so typically, in an ideal scenario, um, what we like to have you know, large-scale clinical trials proving benefit of a medical intervention on clinically meaningful outcomes, okay? And we just don't have that yet for uh, the booster vaccines. And that being said, we often have to make uh, decisions based on imperfect data. And so when we have imperfect data, uh, then uh, we don't give blanket recommendations. We, we try to uh, have this be more of a sh shared decision-making situation. So that's why we discussed before uh, a person with psoriatic disease who's older, uh, you, know, old, you know, older than 50, who has underlying health issues, who's six months out from their last uh, vaccine, you know, they may want to consider getting vaccinated, get, get, getting a booster shot because, you know, maybe uh, they're more likely to have benefit uh, th than not. Uh, but we just don't know for certain at this point in time, and, and therefore uh, the um, you know the preference of the patient and the clinician is what really drives things. Uh, that is uh, different than getting a first dose of the vaccines. Okay, it's it's, it's um, abundantly clear that uh, that everyone needs to get vaccinated against COVID nineteen. As I showed you earlier in the data, the, the Delta variant is so incredibly contagious that virtually everyone in the country is going to get exposed to it uh, at some point. Um, and there's no question that the benefit of, the, of being vaccinated tremendously outweighs the risk of being vaccinated. Uh, you can see it in the data. I mean, you, you basically have over a thousand people dying a day, none of whom should be dying. They, they all should be alive. It's really uh, a tragedy that this is happening right now. Definitely. And I think one of the questions we had come in real time tonight is, you know, with the safety of the vaccine thus far, you know, shouldn't everyone be considering a booster? And I think that's, you know, you can comment too, uh, and I, I wish you would, Joel, but, you know, right now that's why FDA and CDC are evaluating that because we definitely want to ensure that everyone in the country is as protected as possible. But to your point, having everyone be vaccinated right now is critical to diminish transmission of our, our current variant and the other possible variants that may come. Any further comments on everyone getting a booster? Oh, well, I think that basically covers it. It's sort of issue of shared decision-making. I think the way people should think about it is really, you know, what are my underlying risks for, for getting in trouble with this virus? You know, so uh, again, people who are older, uh, people who are more than six months out from their last uh, vaccine, people with serious underlying health problems. So those are the people who probably should be thinking about it. And, uh, you know, for those in the psoriatic disease community, in a way, we're sort of fortunate because it seems like the bulk of the data so far, even though the data are imperfect as they are, it seems to, it seems to show that our patients don't seem to have a higher rate of getting infected with the virus uh, or having worse outcomes based on the therapies that they're on. So I, I see a bunch of questions in the chat about things like uh, Otesla uh, and, of course, in the biologics and methotrexate, what have you. Uh, the studies done to date don't really seem to show a meaningfully increased risk of having bad co courses of COVID uh, when you're on these medications. That being said, uh, because of some uncertainty, you know, the CDC took data from people who are of transplants and then generalize it to everyone who's on any type of medication that may target the immune system in some way. Uh, and so in a way, uh, you know, it's sort of an advantage because if you're on one of these medications, it then makes you eligible for a booster vaccine. And then you have to decide uh, individually uh, with your uh, providers whether or not um, it makes sense for you to get a booster at this point in time. Definitely, thank you. So we have a couple of other questions related to the possibility and the, the accessibility to boosters, one of which is related to 
uh, an individual, and this is a common question we're getting to, you know, at this point in time, my provider is not recommending that I get a booster, even though I meet the criteria just outlined, um, because they're, you know, uncomfortable with the data as they stand. As you mentioned, they're, they're fairly um, uh, new and limited at this point in time. And so individuals are asking, you know, my provider is saying I should not get a booster. I would really like to. Any thoughts? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think someone made a question in chat. There's really almost no downside to getting a booster. Okay. Uh, and so when there's uncertainty, uh, then people should err on the side of getting a booster. Um, especially if people meet any of the criteria I mentioned before, you know, uh, older age, health issues, duration from your last booster, things of that nature. Um, and so uh, that's how I would think about it. Um, you know, the reason why we haven't given a blanket recommendation that everyone should get a booster is, again, this is true, there is uncertainty here in terms of when not people need it, because some people may be still so well protected that getting a booster is not going to make a difference for them. Their the risk of getting severe COVID is you know, basically close to zero, and so you can't get much better than that. So why bother getting another vaccine? Um, and, uh, and so that's sort of why there's some uh, confusion about this. But I would say if your provider has told you that you should not get a booster, um, I would ask why. Uh, because for the most part, of any patient of mine who asks for a booster who qualifies, I, I tell them exactly what I've told you all tonight, you know, and, and then we make a decision. But if someone wants it, even though they're young and otherwise healthy, uh, that's fine also. I mean, we, we are living in a very dynamic period of time. Um, you know, for a lot of people who may be young, for example, they may have young children and they're concerned about transmitting the virus to their young children who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. You know, that's an example of a person may say, you know what? Yeah, I, I got my I got fully vaccinated four months ago. I'm 30 years old. I'm totally healthy. But you know what? Uh, it might make sense for that person to get a booster in that unique circumstance. Excellent. Thank you. So we received some questions ahead of time. And now there are a couple in the chat as well, as far as how individuals would go about getting a booster. So as Joel re recommended earlier, you know, speaking to your provider is one of the best ways. Many practices are offering boosters depending on uh, your local and state uh, practices at this point in time. But really, I, I would say, you know, speaking to your provider is a good start no matter what. Um, in certain states, uh, pharmacies are still the primary way. Uh, they're having booster clinics in some locations now. But if you speak to your provider, they can let you know the best uh, method. Um, in addition, there are some areas where they're not asking for verification. Um, some locations are requesting that there is verification that you fit into one of these groups. That's something as simple as your provider providing a note or a letter and being able to bring that to the pharmacy. I, I will tell you in, in my experience locally, um, where I live in the Rocky Mountain region, if you uh, go to a provider or to a, a pharmacy that is that have boosters or vaccinations available um, and let them know your circumstance, I, I've not heard of a patient that's not been able to get the booster. But, right. you know, Joel, I'd, I'd uh, welcome you to comment on that as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And I think, you know, just, just screenshot the MPF task force guidance. So that way it demonstrates your eligibility. You can say, here it is you know, from, from, the, from the experts, uh, and I'm on this medication, so that makes me eligible. So that way there's any uh, uncertainty around it that, that then allows you to uh, demonstrate to the pharmacist that you're eligible uh, for the vaccine. Uh, I did notice a, a question in the chat I wanted to address this briefly. So it says, can you get the vaccine if you're pregnant, uh, the mRNA vaccines? And the answer is absolutely yes, and absolutely you should get it. Um, you know, I, I just want to give two personal experiences. In the beginning of the pandemic, uh, March 2020, uh, we in dermatology were busy uh, triaging patients uh, who um, who had positive test results, and you know uh, I'll never forget uh, you know the cases of people who I was calling telling them that their that their their test was positive, including uh, a young mom who had just given birth, her child was still in the NICU. This woman could barely breathe. She was 20 years old. I had to send her to the emergency room. Uh, and one of my last consults I did in the hospital when I was uh, attending in the hospital on, on consults a month or two ago uh, was um, uh, a young woman, 30 years old, uh, got COVID while pregnant, still had not yet held her baby. She was still intubated. 
um, uh, from COVID, you know, a month later. We know pregnant people uh, are more susceptible to getting severely ill with COVID, uh, and the FDA, CDC, and, and virtually all, um, uh, um, you know, buys like, uh, in the field of OB-GYN recommend pregnant people get vaccinated. Excellent. Thank you. And the next series of questions we have are things that you've touched on a bit, and, and I think that for the most part, we can refer people back to the guidance statements, and that's just related to the risk for those living with thoracic disease and the, the multiple um, treatments that they may, on, may be on, whether that's phototherapy or an ointment or an oral systemic therapy or a biologic. And, and so just in, in general, could you comment on the task force guidance on those that are on different treatments for thoracic disease and, and what the recommendations are for receiving a booster or vaccination? Right, yeah. So, you know, because our therapies don't seem to meaningfully impact how well the vaccines work, we generally recommend people to stay on their, their therapies that they're taking for psoriatic disease during the vaccine period. Um, you know, there's some of our treatments uh, that may, uh, you know, marginally affect how well the vaccines work, things like methotrexate, for example. Um, but, you know, there's just not enough data right now to suggest that it impacts it so much that people really have to stop uh, the drug. Uh, we, you know, we do have some nuanced uh, recommendations. You know, if you're getting a one-dose vaccine, like the J and J vaccine, uh, and you're 60 year older with underlying health issues, those are people we worry about uh, having vaccine failure. Um, you know, those folks in consultation with their prescriber may want to hold a methotrexate for two weeks uh, after their vaccine, with the theoretical hope of getting a better antibody response. And as I mentioned earlier, those getting a third booster shot. Uh, who are on methotrexate, their disease is doing really well, very well controlled. They may want to consider holding methotrexate for two weeks in consultation with their prescriber. Uh, again, this is based on uh, hypothetical benefit. There's no proven benefit of that. And none of the data that's been shown to date has indicated that people on methotrexate um, uh, you know, have a problem you know, doing well on the vaccine. We don't see any evidence that they're uh, showing up in the hospital more as vaccine failures and, and people not on methotrexate. So that's pretty reassuring. And we'll get back to antibody response in a minute because there's a number of questions about that. But before we move to that, um, talking about the type of booster shot. So we've had some questions prior to the town hall tonight and in the chat as well, as far as is the booster shot something different than the vaccine? Meaning, did it does it have different materials, different concentrations, those types of things? And I think we're finding that there's some confusion about what a traditional booster is, maybe versus a third shot of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, after answering that, kind of related to if we if individuals do receive a booster, should they be receiving the same booster that they received in their initial vaccinations? Meaning, if someone got vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine, that that's what they're receiving for the booster. Yeah. So, um, so this is sort of like a Shakespearean question, you know, what's in the name? Okay. You know, and uh, in this case, really, there's not much in the name. Uh, they're really synonyms. Uh, third dose, booster, uh, they basically mean the same thing. It's the exact same vaccine uh, that you would get for your first dose, for your second dose, or your third dose is exactly the same. So change in and, and the, the concentration or what's in it, what have you. Uh, you know, FDA and CDC have recommended that you should get the same um, third dose or booster as the first two doses you've gotten, just because uh, the studies that have been done in people who have been transplanted, again, so people with transplant, organ transplants, that the study showed that some of those people got a better vaccine, a better antibody response in their blood when they got a third dose of the same vaccine. Right, if they got Moderna. They got Moderna. If they got Pfizer. They got Pfizer. So we don't really have data uh, for people who got two doses of Pfizer and then got a dose of Moderna, or two doses of Moderna and then got a dose. Of, we still had that data uh, in a rigorous way, and so that's why the recommendation is get the same dose as you've gotten before, and that's why I recommend the people. Uh, the, the FDA um, and CDC, as you really said, the CDC has said though that let's say you got Pfizer. And for whatever reason, they don't have Pfizer where you are to have Moderna, then fine, get Moderna as your booster if you're inclined to get the booster. Excellent, thank you. So one of the, the most prominent questions that we've gotten is regarding timing. So, you know, timing between when the, the second uh, vaccination occurred, there are a number of individuals now that, you know, have been at least eight months, particularly a number of our providers that were vaccinated very mm -hmm. early on. 
Um, and, you know, there are others that, as you noted, may have gotten their second vaccination four months ago, six months ago. Can you, number one, comment on the, the timing and any data we have for that for the third shot or the booster? And then also, you know, as the fall is approaching, individuals that may be, you know, six months past their second vaccination date, is it better to wait a little longer so they have a vaccination that carries them through winter upper respiratory season? You know, and I think that's a, mm -hmm. a very you know, understandable question that people have. You know, how do I time this so I have my best protection during one of the peak seasons? Right. Yeah. So, um, so I would say first, you know, from the label and uh, from the CDC, this third dose or booster dose, wherever we're going to refer to it as, uh, should be at least 28 days after your last. Pfizer or Moderna. That's the earliest you possibly want to do it. This is really based on people who have an organ transplant. Uh, that's where the data is derived from. So uh, on the task force, you know, I, I don't think any of us would recommend that our patients get a third dose, you know, a month after they got their second dose of vaccine. We just don't think it's necessary. And, and we sh I showed you a bunch of data uh, already about how highly effective these vaccines are. You're starting to see some signals of waning immunity, waning immunity roughly six months past the second dose of an mRNA vaccine. Um, that's really around having symptomatic infection. We're not, we haven't really seen clearly a signal of waning immunity against um, uh, severe infection, a common infection that will land you in the hospital uh, or land you, uh, you know, or, or have a worse outcome than that. Um, and so it's really the six month mark that a lot of us are sort of looking at to say, okay, some evidence here that six months is when the, the risk of having some symptomatic infection starts to be picking up uh, again. So maybe that's when we should start thinking about giving these, these extra doses. Uh, in terms of the second part of that question, well, should I time it around um, you know, when I think the peak of this will be? Uh, I wouldn't overthink these things uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, it's, you know, you know, ultimately, we want to make uh, scientifically driven, database driven decisions, and also uh, decisions that 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 are unique to an individual's individual circumstances. Um, and so, those who are more vulnerable due to age, underlying health issues, uh, you know, they may want to err on the side of caution and, and get vaccinated. You know, get their booster dose sooner. Uh, and those who are younger and and, and healthier. Uh, you know, may want to wait uh, for more data to emerge. They fully understand the degree of benefit they'll have. Excellent. Thank you. So I think related to timing and also thinking about fall and winter as far as potential flu season, correct? And, and usually uh, we're recommending that not only those in, in our community, but overall people are getting the flu vaccination. Um, and we have said that individuals, you know, should be uh, getting the flu vaccination as well. Do you have any suggestions as far as timing of receiving the flu vaccination and the COVID-19 vaccination or booster? Yeah. So when the mRNA vaccines first came out under EUA, the, the recommendation was to, to separate these vaccines out uh, because uh, we wanted to have more data on safety. You know, I mean, the, the initial clinical trials were massive, tens of thousands of people. Uh, but we tend to like data in hundreds of thousands of people if we can get it. In this case, now we have data in millions, like uh, over you know, hundreds of millions of people now with the mRNA vaccines. Um, and so now we have enough data to understand the safety profile very well of the mRNA vaccines. So now it, it's acceptable. If, you, if, if you're ready to get your flu shot and you want to get your mRNA booster at the same time, that's fine. Uh, you, know, you, you probably want to get it in different shoulders uh, and you may have two sore arms. Uh, so it's really uh, up to uh, the um, individual on that. Excellent. And I think, you know, related to that, and then I have one more timing question. There's been several questions that have come in, um, again, prior to or in the chat regarding uh, the possibility of, of having shingles um, post-vaccination. And the data you showed um, in your presentation mm -hmm. indicated that that is one of the potential risks that people could have a flare. I think it goes back to risk benefits. But I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sharing your commentary as far as the, the possibility of that would be wonderful. Yeah. So one is, is there's no reason to think that uh, getting the um, uh, one of the mRNA vaccines would reduce the effectiveness of a shingles vaccine if you already had it. OK. And so uh, the, the data that's been reported so far, I mean, first of all, it's, it's not been a lot of cases 
of shingles reported period. So it, it's hard to really drill down in this, but uh, I suspect these people probably hadn't been vaccinated previously uh, against shingles. Uh, but in any event, the rate is really low. I mean, you're talking about one or two cases uh, out of 5,000 people vaccinated. Okay, That, that means uh, 4,999 people are not going to have this problem. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's a really low issue, and it's not that much higher than the background rate of shingles in the population. Uh, shingles is also very common in older individuals, people 60, 70, 80. That's when the rates of shingles go up substantially. And so uh, any extra risk from the vaccine is likely pretty small. And it's certainly not a reason not to get the vaccination. Excellent. Thank you. So um, one more timing question. You know, unfortunately, we've all seen the rates of those that have been infected. Um, hopefully, many, even if they've had some uh, infection post-vaccination, it's been mild. But if someone has uh, tested positive and been asymptomatic or symptomatic, how long should those individuals wait to receive their booster after being sick? Okay. Well, I want to address a, a question that you didn't ask first, and I'll ask, address that question. Um, so, um, one thing is, you know, if you come down with COVID, uh, whether, you know, especially if, if you chose not to get vaccinated, uh, you need to know that the only thing that's been proven to be effective for people who have early COVID illness that they're not sick enough to be in the hospital is these uh, antibody cocktails. Okay, these are synthetic antibodies, similar to say the biologics we use for psoriasis, you know, made in this case to target uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 illness. Uh, so in this case, instead of making the antibodies naturally from say a vaccine, they're infusing them uh, antibodies they've made uh, in a laboratory setting. And, and those clearly dramatically lower the risk uh, of having severe COVID illness and people who get these antibodies compared to placebo. They also are helpful in people who've had a, a, an exposure and are not yet infected. They can prevent infection. And so sometimes they use in nursing home settings, things of that nature. So, uh, you know, the problem with the antibody cocktails is that they're hard to get. I mean, I, I just mentioned you, we have 150,000 people getting infected a day across the country. We, we do not have anywhere near that kind of capacity to give everyone antibody cocktails uh, who's infected. So generally speaking, I think people who are higher risk, you know, uh, folks who, uh, again, are older, uh, have underlying severe health issues, what have you, if you come down with COVID, you should be in touch with your, with your doctor and see if you're a candidate for these antibody therapies, because that would be the one thing that could be done that we know uh, would lower uh, your risk of getting severely ill. Now, Fortunately, if you've been vaccinated, uh, your risk against severely ill is very low, okay? Because now uh, the biggest risk for getting severely ill and dying of COVID is being unvaccinated. It's not that you're 85 years old. It's not that, you, that you've had an organ transplant. It's not that um, you know, you're a smoker or, 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 or overweight, have other health issues. It's that you're unvaccinated. That, that is by far the biggest risk factor for uh, getting hospitalized and, and dying. Okay, the next question was really, okay, well, I've had COVID-19, uh, um, you know, should I get vaccinated or when should I get my booster? Well, you know, here, uh, you know, the, the data are a little bit more clear as well. Um, it's pretty clear that, um, that having immunity from vaccination uh, is better than immune, natural immunity, that those people are less likely to get, have uh, symptomatic infection, they've been vaccinated, and if they were uh, immune because they previously were infected with the virus. So for that reason, the general recommendation is that if you've been infected with the virus in the past, you should get vaccinated because uh, the immunity and protection you have, while there is definitely some from prior infection, is probably not as good as getting the vaccine. Um, you know, if you've had a infection after you've been fully vaccinated, you know, when should you get a booster? Uh, you know, it's really hard to say. I mean, it, you know, the, the guess is that you're pretty well immune from those experiences, and that would be the same uh, discussions before. You would do it based on some time period from when your last vaccine was, you know, six months or more, uh, and based on your underlying health issues. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> so, excuse me, one of the other things that <clears throat> the last time in question really is related back to, there's been some questions about stopping a current therapy. Again, this is why I had noted about commenting on our prior guidance, um, Joel, re regarding 
those individuals that are on medications, because this third dose really is the same vaccination, the same guidances would apply, correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Okay, so I wanna be very mindful of time. And one of the, uh, the areas that there's been a ton of questions about is the level of antibodies. <clears throat> so there are a number of individuals that, whether it was their first vaccination or their second, they, you know, were given an antibody titer number, either their provider, you know, really felt that that was necessary, it was out of interest. Some people have participated in clinical studies to try to, to determine a link, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. But could you comment a little bit? Because to me, this is one of the, the biggest challenges that we have right now is that if there's no antibody response, then that obviously is a concern, but we don't have a threshold. And so trying to reach this particular antibody titer or something like that that isn't isn't as informative, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts for the group this evening. Yeah. So the CDC, uh, as well as the task force, uh, feels that uh, getting uh, blood tests to look for antibody levels after vaccine is not advisable. Uh, and this is because uh, the correlation between antibody levels in these commercial lab tests and protection for a vaccine is completely unknown. It's not a known thing right now. Uh, and it, the result of that test shouldn't change your behavior. Uh, so, you know, if you're in a situation where COVID's, um, you know, uh, very active in the community, which is basically most places these days, um, you know, you're going to want to be masking when you're indoors, whether your antibody test is positive or not. And, and that's why we, we don't necessarily feel uh, that it makes medical sense uh, to, um, uh, to have this done. Uh, and, and there are no uh, T-cell uh, tests that can be done. I see in the chat people asking that question. That is a experimental laboratory-based uh, test for research purposes. It's not something that's commercially available uh, at this point in time, nor is it also, nor, nor how that predicts protection is not uh, known uh, either. Thank you. And you know, one of the other questions we're getting a lot is, I've already had COVID. Why would I still get vaccinated? Why would I even consider a booster? And I have a personal comment that I can make there, but I'll, I'll let you answer that one first and, and uh, then I can chime in. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think the, the problem with natural immunity from a virus is that it's very unpredictable. You know, viruses are, are really uh, successful, sneaky little uh, uh, proteins have figured out how to evade our immune system. And so when you develop uh, immunity from, um, from a virus, uh, you know, you also develop all sorts of other antibodies that could not be good for you and cannot be good, for, may not be good for you next time you get re-exposed again. Um, and so that's the general reason why uh, people feel like if you've been infected and recovered, based on other studies that have been done, uh, predominantly healthcare workers, I believe, that show that your risk of getting reinfected is higher if you've been from natural immunity than from getting vaccinated, that the recommendation is that you still get vaccinated if you had a prior uh, COVID infection. Excellent. And there are some examples. We have some questions when, when individuals are on higher dose methotrexate and some of the more powerful immunosuppressive therapies as far as not having an antibody response. And, and I think that you've touched on that briefly, but I think in, in that case, from an NPS standpoint, we'd recommend that you, know, you talk to your provider um, and come up with a strategy. You know, whether you are in those situations or whether you're not, I think even myself, I'm fully vaccinated and you still have to make choices as far as health policy and protection, particularly knowing what we do now about the Delta variant and the possibility of infection, or if not infection, transmission of the, the variants. So, you know, I, I don't know, um, Joel, if you have any further comments, but for those that are on those immunosuppressive therapies and maybe haven't seen an antibody response, you know, they've now decided to stop methotrexate and, and try to see if they can receive a response. I still think that they may be in a category that need to take greater precautions and, and follow yeah. CDC guidance. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that makes uh, you know perfect sense uh, for people to be on the cautious side if they're on certain medications, and that's a task force guidance that we've given. Uh, although that being said, I, I do want to reassure people, you know, when we're seeing uh, vaccine failures, people getting sick enough to be hospitalized or having severe cases of COVID after being vaccinated, you know, it's not people on methotrexate. You know, it's people on transplant medications. Uh, medications that, that uh, wipe out your B cell count uh, that are used for things like uh, multiple sclerosis, not the kind of drugs that we use and the doses we use uh, for psoriatic disease. So that, that's pretty reassuring what we've seen 
uh, to date. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we're almost at time here, but I've, I'm gonna ask three more questions. One of which is, does the third shot or booster uh, protect us against the Delta variant? We've talked about the, the attributes of that variant and any other future variants that may be coming. Yeah, so um, certainly the first two doses seem to be protective against the Delta variant. Uh, and so there's no reason to think that the third dose would not be protective against the Delta variant. Um, future variants, um, you know, it's something that's being monitored closely uh, around the world about whether or not uh, these new things called variants of concern may, ha may potentially, uh, you know, be able to escape the vaccines we have. But to date, and there's been many, many variants out there. They're up to mu, uh, m in the alphabet. Uh, and so there's yet to be a variant that's been that's been documented to be able to evade the benefits of vaccination so far. Excellent. Um, and then, you know, there's been a lot of discussion early on about immunocompromised and, and how that definition went into play as far as determining who's eligible for the booster first. Can you comment on those with psoriatic disease being immunocompromised, and then depending on what medication or what treatment plan that they may be on, how that would render them immunocompromised. Yeah, so we know that people with psoriatic disease seem to be a little more susceptible to infection in general compared to people without psoriatic disease, particularly those who have more severe uh, psoriasis. Um, that being said, it does not seem from the data uh, thus far, year and a half into the pandemic, that psoriasis itself increases the risk in a meaningful way of getting infected with the virus or having a worse course of COVID-19. So, so that's pretty reassuring information. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, just, I lost my second part of the question was about, uh, was about the treatment or, or, or remind me, Stacey? Yeah, so what treatments would be, you know, put them in the category? Maybe oh, maybe right, yeah, some right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so it goes back to what I said before, you know, what, uh, the, the Shakespearean question, you know, what's in the, not, what's the name, you know? Uh, and in, in this case, you know, the, the CDC has taken a category of people, those who are on transplant medications that are broadly immunosuppressive that clearly increase the risk of infections, uh, and then generalize it to, to most medications that have some immune modulation. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what that basically means is that, you know, if we are on a medication that targets your immune system, it makes you eligible, even though it may not impact your risk of getting COVID uh, or, um, or having uh, a problem with the vaccine. Excellent. Thank you. And then the last question, and I want to um, make sure that we have a few more minutes in case uh, Jane and Bev have some things for us at the end as well, relates really back to vaccine hesitancy. So, Right now, you know, the, the guidance statements, the task force, the MPF has been very clear about the benefit of being vaccinated. Um, we have, you know, vaccine hesitancy that's still prevalent, unfortunately, in, in, in many areas. Um, we have individuals that are even being taken care of by others where, you know, they're, they're not being allowed or they're not encouraged to take the vaccination. Do you have any comments on making the decision to be vaccinated right now? And then also if there's but one vaccine that's better than the other. Right, yeah. So uh, I think that this is uh, a part of the human condition. Uh, there's always going to be a, a portion of us who are anxious about um, getting anything, uh, anything medicinal, uh, shot, you name it. Uh, and that's just the reality of how the human uh, brain works. Um, and, you know, there was a time uh, before Delta where a lot of us felt, well, you know what, if people don't want to get vaccinated and it's a small proportion of the population, all right, well, all right, well, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's not a good idea, but we'll see what happens. But now we have Delta, which I showed you before is exponentially more infective. That option is off the table now. Um, for those who choose not to get vaccinated, they're basically playing Russian roulette. Uh, they're hoping that when they get exposed to the virus, that they'll be fortunate enough to not get sick enough to be in the hospital and die of this disease or not develop long COVID syndrome from it and be disabled from this disease or not pass it on to a loved one and give it to that person to have that person die of the disease. And you can see what's going on uh, in the U.S. population when, when people take that strategy. You have, you have over a thousand people dying a day now, almost all of them unvaccinated. It is heartbreaking. And so, you know, uh, the best I can tell people who are hesitant is, you know, the data are overwhelming that vaccination is what needs to be done. 
to, you know, to reduce uh, the risk of dying of this horrible illness and also to ultimately um, benefit our entire society. So you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for your community. Uh, because there are lots of health systems in the South right now where if you get in a car accident or you're having a heart attack or you need um, uh, to be hospitalized for cancer treatment, uh, you're going to have a hard time getting medical care. And that is a tragic situation. So then you have people who uh, have gotten vaccinated, uh, aren't, don't have COVID, and they can't get the, can't get the life-saving medical care they need because there's not enough of the health system available. So, so this is really uh, a, you know, a unique public health crisis and the time for all of us to do our part uh, to get us on the other side of this. Exactly. Thank you, Joel. And uh, one last question because it came in and I wanted to address this. So there was a comment made that, you know, but vaccinated people can still spread. Uh, yes, that with Delta variant, that's one of the things we have seen, but the rate of transmission and, and really more than anything, the, you know, this is where following health policy along with being vaccinated is important and making, you know, um, uh, smart decisions about the things we're doing to prevent the spread until we can actually squelch the, the spread of, of Delta right now. And to Joel's point, um, you know, as Delta has spread mainly again through those that are unvaccinated, our hospital system has become overwhelmed. And so in that case, not only as Joel just indicated, are, are individuals that maybe need healthcare for other things not getting it, we're also, you know, continuing to have uh, that massive spread because of these severe illnesses, um, burdening our healthcare system, losing individuals like that. You know, I can comment that uh, my father waited to be vaccinated and, you know, eight weeks in the ICU and three months later, and now in long COVID rehab, uh, you know, he regrets waiting. And, you know, and, and every person is going to be different with their choices. But for those that have seen some of these personal experiences, our providers, um, you know, the experience I just shared for our family, um, it really does make a difference as far as the, the, what the vaccine can do. Yeah, um, so I think that, it's very hard. I think it's very hard for people who are not engaged in healthcare to understand understand what sounds like an abstract idea. I, I got sick. I went to the hospital. But, but really, the best way I can explain it is that people feel like they're drowning when they have this virus. It is a horrible experience for people. It's terrifying for everyone involved, for the patient and for those caring for the patient. Uh, it's just it's something that uh, absolutely you, you don't want to experience firsthand if you can avoid it. For sure. So with that being said, um, I'm going to turn it back to Jane and Bev. Um, and before I do, I want to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Gelfand. Um, as always, very informative, insightful, um, and uh, very open uh, discussion tonight, Joel. Uh, Jane and Bev, anything further that Dr. Gelfand and I can um, offer this evening? Uh, I'll just do a quick reminder about the COVID-19 Resource Center, which you both uh, mentioned previously. Uh, here's the website address where you can access the Resource Center, as well as the COVID-19 guidance statements. And then next slide. And then finally, uh, you can watch this town hall, our previous COVID-19 town hall from May 19th and other presentations in our watch and listen area. You can also listen to podcasts for more information about COVID-19, such as episode 11 about the COVID-19 vaccines and psoriatic disease, which also included Dr. Gelfand and rheumatologist, Dr. Christopher Richland, as well as episode 69, Fact versus Fiction, a pulmonologist view of COVID-19 with Dr. Albert Rizzo, Chief Medical Officer of the American Lung Association. So there are other resources available for you to access as well. So thank you very much to Stacey and Dr. Gelfand for providing yet another invaluable and highly informative town hall about COVID-19 and our latest concerns. This concludes our presentation for today. Thank you for attending. Bev, can I make one final comment? I know that there's several questions in the chat and that were submitted that Dr. Gelfand and I were not able to get to. If there are questions, I will, you know, offer that individuals can reach out to us directly as well, um, particularly their specific cases with your health history, um, and we're happy to provide any insight that we can. People could tweet at me at Dr. Joel Gelfand is a good place to reach me. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks all.
Good night. Good night.